creation grows for a world in darkness frozen like a stone light is breaking in a stable for a throne and he shall reign forever travel far if I were a shepherd I would do my part but poor as I favorite time of the year it's Christmas I love the I love the songs we sing at Christmas because we only sing them once a year <laughs> and they're really great songs that song in particular is I love that song one of my favorite scriptures is John 1 there's so much um, there's so much amazing truth in John 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of that light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And then there's a couple more verses, and we skip to verse 29 because the next song we're going to sing is the song, the most important song of Christmas. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Our job is to get that out. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ was born. Let's, go, let's sing, Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ was born. Go tell it on the mountain. Oh, I think I got the key wrong there. I apologize. I, that was going to be really high, and I'm not good at that. Go, go tell it on the mountain. sing. Give us just a second here as we transition.
be seated. Uh, let's conduct a poll, all right? This past week was a great week. It was what? Thanksgiving week. How many of you are turkey people? You're a turkey person. Raise your hand there. All right, how many of you are ham people? How many of you have no distinguishment? You'll do both or either. Amen, right? I tell you, man, I love Thanksgiving, and uh, what, a, what a great day of spending time with uh, friends, family, fellowshipping with one another, but also reminding ourselves of how much we have to be thankful for. Our God is a good God, isn't He? Say amen to that. Let me give you a praise this week. Uh, Mac, on the back row there. Mac, raise your hand if you would. Mac has been coming for about three weeks. Uh, after church last Sunday morning, he placed his faith in Christ and became a child of God. Can you rejoice with that? Monday, he had two stints put into his heart. And uh, so on Monday, had those stints put in, and a uh, doctor said things went well. And so we're rejoicing in that recovery. It's great to see him. Give him some space this morning, uh, but you can encourage him. It's great to see him this morning. Uh, man, I'm thankful for each of you. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, so many that I've met for the first time this morning, or maybe just the second time. If you're here and you're a guest today, we want to welcome you. And uh, we hope that you enjoy it today. I'll tell you this, I say it uh, each week. If you're here for the first time, you've been prayed for already. There are people here that pray for you before you even get here. And we've prayed that you would feel welcomed and wanted here. But most of all, that you would get to meet our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that you'd be introduced to Him in all of His glory. Surely we have a job to do telling it on the mountain, right? Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God, came made himself flesh, died so that we could have life. What a truly great uh, thing that is. What a joy, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Listen, I have quite a few announcements today, and so I want to just run right through them if I can. Uh, we have a work. I don't think we have a slide for this, but we have a, a meeting with all our children's ministry workers this morning. And so if you work in the children's ministry uh, in teaching or helping on Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, a meeting right after the service in the wing here, and uh, we'll have a great time there. On Wednesday evenings, we're doing a series called From Creation to the Cross. And we're walking through the story of Christ from the beginning. And uh, we're uh, in Genesis right now. We would invite you to come and be a part of that uh, Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Uh, we're going to be doing a special series in December on Sunday evenings. And uh, Bobby Babnick is going to be leading that Bible study. He normally plays the bass guitar back here. Uh, you pray for him. He's sick today. Uh, but he's doing a Bible study called Wisdom, Wealth, and the Word. And it's going to be the three Sunday nights in December. And we're going to look at what the Bible says about money and stewardship, uh, investing, saving, giving, all those things. And uh, I pray that you would make it a priority uh, to be here. You say, well, I don't normally come on Sunday nights for three Sunday Sunday nights, right, in December, uh, come and be a part of that. I believe it will be a blessing to you, be a tremendous encouragement to you. There's a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center uh, to sign up, to come to that. We need to know how many handouts and things to have prepared. Uh, so sign up for that. It's going to be a great time. Uh, we have our ladies' Christmas party uh, Friday, December 17th at 6.30. Bethann, give us a blurb on that real quick. Stand up and just tell us what that is about. And who is invited? So all adult ladies are welcome, um, and it'll just be a time of fellowship. Um, come, you can wear your Christmas pajamas. We're going to do a Christmas movie, um, food, desserts, snacks. Um, there's a sign-up sheet in the back for ladies to sign up to bring food um, or desserts or whatever you'd like to bring um, just to share with one another. And we will do a, a Christmas gift exchange. So $10 is the um, limit, like 10 to 15 but um, bring a gift, and then we'll do a fun exchange. Um, but it'll just be a really sweet time of fellowship fellowship and hanging out as ladies and um, it'll be fun. So any so, ladies are invited to that? Any ladies, yes. Friday, December 17th at 6.30. Yes. So that's going to be a great time. Ladies, you'll want to be here, uh, be a part of that. We're going to do something a little different this year. We haven't done this before, uh, but Bethanna and I are going to be hosting a Christmas open house at our house this year. 
It's going to be December 18th, so the day after the ladies' Christmas party, uh, December 18th from 3 to 6 p.m. Um, our house is not huge, and so the way we're going to do it is we're going to split your names by last name and give you a window to come. So say come from 3 to 4 or 4 to 5 or 5 to 6, because as much as we want you all to come over to our house, we can't fit you all at once, right? And so we're going to have a great time. Uh, just come in, pop in, spend some time together. We'll have some appetizers and snacks and things like that. Uh, come spend some time together. We live about three minutes from the church. And so if you're trying to get a, 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 a frame of reference there, about three minutes from the church. And that's Saturday, December 18th. That's a Saturday before Christmas. And we want to have you over for uh, a little bit of fellowship at our house. And so we'll get you more information uh, on that. We'll, we'll tell you what names we're splitting that up by. If you do us a favor, though, please help us with this. Sign up if you want to come and be a part of that so that we know how much food to have and we know where to split the names and things like that. So there's a sign up sheet out at the Welcome Center for that too. Um, and then lastly, um, I think we have uh, on the 20, let's see, the 21st, that is the Tuesday before Christmas, we're going to be having a candlelight service here at the church at 7 p.m. And so we'll be singing Christmas carols, having a great time of fellowship there. Uh, so December 21st, Tuesday night, candlelight service here at the church. And I want to invite you to come and be a part of that. And I think it will be a great blessing to you. And then if you don't have plans on Christmas morning, we're going to have a Christmas breakfast here at the church. We've done this for several years, and there are a lot of folks that don't have a place to go at Christmas, uh, don't really have family around and things like that. And we want you to be able to fellowship with family. And so Christmas morning, 10 a.m., uh, we're going to have a breakfast here at the church. You can come if you have family, if you don't have family. If you want to serve and love on others, uh, I think that's a great thing to do. Come spend Christmas with a bunch of other people. Uh, I've told Beth Ann, we've talked about this together. We want Sadie to grow up knowing that Christmas isn't all about getting presents right? Christmas is the love of Christ, right? Christmas is what God has done for us. And I think there's just something about loving other people, serving other people, fellowshipping with other people. And as many people who want to come on that Christmas breakfast, uh, you are invited to be a part of that. If you want to come and help us cook or clean up or set up, uh, we will need help with that too. And so there is a sign up sheet at the Welcome Center as well for that. Now I've told you now four times that we have four sign up sheets at the Welcome Center. This church does a lot of things really well. You're nice, right? For the most part, you're nice. You smile. This church feels like family. I'm thankful. You're not good at signing up on sign-up sheets. Let's change it this year, right? Change it. Let's let this be the time that we uh, get better at sign-up sheets. Listen, please help us with that. Sign up on the way out. And uh, it only takes a few seconds to jot your name down and uh, sign up on those sign-up sheets. And I believe that will be a great blessing. It is awesome to have Rick and Brenda Osborne with us this morning. Uh, Rick and Brenda are our missionaries uh, to Liberia. And uh, just a few weeks ago, I was in Haiti in Dominican Republic and uh, Rick filled in for me. I'm so grateful for that. Uh, but we want to have uh, Rick come and if he would just pray for us as we open our service. And then Brenda is going to be beginning, uh, beginning treatment tomorrow uh, for cancer. And so uh, if we could, before you pray, I would like to pray, if you don't mind, and pray for Brenda, and then we'll have you pray for our service. And uh, listen, uh, Brenda is a blessing, and we're so, so thankful for her. But let's pray uh, real quick for her, and then we'll have Rick pray, and uh, we'll get on with our service. Father, we love you, and we are so grateful for you. We're thankful for everything you've done in this church and bringing the people together you have. And Father, this morning we think about Brenda and beginning treatment tomorrow. And uh, God, I know she doesn't want to be uh, highlighted or embarrassed, but we are grateful for her. We're so thankful for the ministry that she's had, um, just the blessing that she is. And God, we pray that you give doctors wisdom, that you give her strength. And God, that you would be glorified through all of that. We pray for healing and we pray that that uh, treatment would go well that, God, you would do everything um, there that you want and that you would be glorified through it all. We thank you for their faithfulness, years and years of faithfulness 
We're so grateful for them, and I pray that you would just encourage their hearts. pray that you'd wrap your arms around Brenda, love on her, and I pray that we as a church family would continue to bring her before you in prayer and that you would be glorified there. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Rick, would you pray for our service today? Father, we continue in prayer, and certainly as we are in this season of Thanksgiving, and we all understand that we should give thanks on a daily basis, and, and we do that. But, Lord, we're mindful at, at this time of year of all the things that you do for us. We recognize our unworthiness of all that you do for us and have done for us, and we want to give thanks for that. And Father, now as we enter a, another season of celebrating your birth, Lord, again, uh, we are so unworthy that you would come to this earth for the sole purpose of dying in our place, taking a, upon yourself all of our sins and then pouring your righteousness upon us. And Lord, we thank you for the, the salvation of Mac just uh, this past week. And Lord, if there's anyone else here who does not know you as their Savior, we pray that today would be that day. Lord, if they don't know you and they trust you, this will be the greatest Christmas they've ever experienced. They will see you as they've never seen you. The hymns will have meaning like they've never had before. The sermons, of course, will speak to their hearts as a sermon has never spoken to their heart before. So, Lord, we pray that you would work in the service today. And God, speaking of the sermon, the message, we pray that the message today would speak to our hearts. God, that you would challenge us, that you would convict us if necessary. But, Lord, may your Holy Spirit minister to our hearts and to our lives. We Commit, Lord, this service into your hands. We pray that your will would be done and accomplished in everything that takes place. And we ask it in our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and stand to your feet. If you're a guest with us this right before you get to the doors there drop it in that box on your way out and uh, I know that'll be a blessing to be able to stay connected to you do me a favor before Stephen starts this next song look to your left look to your right tell the person next to you you're glad they're here today and then Stephen lead us in worship all right we're gonna sing this next song adore it is a new song that you might might not know um, so you can join in when you feel comfortable singing um, but this is a great song adore you step down from heaven humbly you came God of all creation here with us in a star
grade and under to junior church. How many of you, that's the first time you've ever sung that song? Slip your hand up. I don't think I've ever sung that song before. I don't think I've ever heard that song before. I love it. Uh, Stephen, if we could do that again um, once or twice or a few times uh, before Christmas. That's an awesome, awesome song, isn't it? What a blessing. All right, take your Bibles this morning, if you would, to Acts 17. Acts 17, we have been preaching through the book of Acts now uh, this past year and uh, have seen some incredible uh, pictures of the goodness of our God. We have seen uh, the church on fire, just radically excited to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. How many of you like hearing good news? Good news, right? Good news sounds like a lot of different things to a lot of us, right? Some of you, good news was the best Black Friday sale this past week, right? You were excited that whatever it was, was on sale. How many of you went out Black Friday shopping? Okay, you're not as crazy as I thought you were. How many of you have turned into Cyber Monday people? You've done online shopping, right? How many of you just don't like giving gifts to anyone and you're not going to do it? Looks like we've got a church full of Scrooges right here, right? Uh, no, I'm just teasing. Man, I am. Uh, it's funny I say that because most people shop for themselves on Black Friday uh, more than they all get right here. Uh, Don is like, uh, yes, that would be me. I tell you, I like hearing good news. Um, I, I am grateful. Um, my wife makes fun of me sometimes because I'll hear something exciting and I really just want to tell it to everybody, right? And so she always gives me a hard time like, okay, Jonathan, I'm going to tell you this, but you can't tell anybody. I think that's cruel and unusual punishment. I mean, I think that's awful, but um, I have gotten better at not uh, telling. So if anybody's pregnant, pregnant uh, you can tell me, and I will be much better at not telling that secret, uh, right? <laughs> Thanks to Bethann. Bethann will beat me up if I tell uh, your secret. No, I love good news. The greatest news of all time is that when man, and, and hear me say this, please listen to what I say here. When man blew it with God over and over and over and over again, God did not wipe his hands of mankind. Instead, he sent his only son to pay for that sin. I want you to think about that. As we read the Bible, Bill, you and I have talked about this some. We read the Bible, and the Bible is littered with the stories of people who blew it. Just over and over and over and over again. It's the story of mankind. If you're honest, you'd say it's the story of my life. My life is a uh, life of trial and error. And tr I'm trying, but I mess up and I blow it, right? I am so grateful that when I blow it, 
I don't have to wonder if my God loves me. Say amen to that. Can I tell you that if you have that information, if you know that God does indeed love you, gave himself for you, that is, you ready for this? Treasured information. And can I tell you that there are many in this world who have never heard that good news. That good news. That's where we find ourselves in Acts 17. Paul, Silas, and Timothy have been traveling. They've been ministering. They have been beaten, right? They have literally ridden a roller coaster for the last several chapters. They've just left Berea. And Berea um, is, it was not kind to them, right? Uh, in the sense that the Bereans were receptive and open to the Word of God. But... Uh, there was a group that didn't like what was happening from the city they had just been at that says, whoa, hold on a second. We're going to stir up some trouble here. So they come to Berea and mess up what God was doing there, right? They start protesting and, and, and Paul ends up leaving the city and getting out of there. And uh, we find in chapter number 17, verse number 16, he's reached a new destination in Athens. Athens is in Greece. And we look at a group of people that are, in, in our dynamic, the way we would look at it, we would say they are smart, this culture here in Athens. They are creative. Uh, they would be cultured. Um, they were well known for being intellectual. Matter of fact, you look at people like uh, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, all of them from Athens. They were thinkers, right? But they did not know God. Now that sounds weird because we're going to see in this message that they were very religious. They were very, very religious. It is estimated that they worshipped, that culture worshipped up to 30,000 gods. Okay. They were very religious, but they did not know the only God that matters. They did not know the God of the Bible. They did not understand who he was. And we're going to uh, we're going to see that in our text this morning. So take your Bibles, Acts 17, uh, verse number uh, 16, and we'll read just the first five or six verses here. We will lay some groundwork, and then we'll flesh out some of the rest of the passage. All right? Verse number 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? That's, um, that's an interesting way to introduce somebody, right? What's this babbler going to say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and they brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine which thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. You're, you're telling us some strange stuff. We'd like to know what it means. Right? Verse number 21. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Let's pray, and we're going to jump into a really, really awesome passage of Scripture. Uh, this is known in the Bible as the story of Paul preaching at Mars Hill. And of all the messages that Paul preaches in the Bible, uh, this one may be my favorite. I love hearing how he teaches uh, Christ to a group of people that were religious but empty. 
And I love how it's presented uh, to them. My prayer is that today, if you do not know Christ, my prayer is that you would be presented clearly with who He is, that you would understand that life without Him is empty, and that life with Him is everything. Life without Him is empty, and life with Him is everything. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for Your Word. I pray that You would speak to us through it. I pray that Your Spirit would accomplish in us exactly what You desire for it to. I know that I am definitely an imperfect messenger, but I thank You that we have a perfect message in Your Word. I'm so grateful that Your Spirit speaks to us, that your word is alive. And God, I pray that I'd not say anything today that I shouldn't, but that I would say everything that I should. But most of all, God, we pray that you'd be glorified. Every person that's in this room right now, you know their background, their story. You are their father. And there are some people who doubtless know a lot about you, but Father, the Bible tells us that it's only through a relationship with Jesus Christ that you will have a knowledge of them come eternity. Father, that unless they place their faith in you, they will spend eternity separated from you. And God, some people have a very hard time with that. But Father, I pray that we would relish in the fact that that is not your desire nor your plan for mankind because you are not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. And God, I pray that if there's someone here today that does not have a personal relationship with you, my prayer is today would be the day that they begin that. For those of us that are your children, I pray that you'd stoke and kindle in us a fire to reach out to others and to minister to others with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to say just in opening here, before I jump into the text we just read, I want to say this. A lot of what we're reading, studying, and preaching in Acts is seemingly redundant in the sense that it's Paul, Silas, and these early missionaries going from city to city, from person to person, delivering the good news of the gospel. And it seems as though almost every week, it's just yet another story of them doing that again and again and again and again. And for some, they might come to church and they might sit under that and they might think to themselves, man, the same thing yet again, just a different city, a different person, but the same thing over and over and over again. I want to tell you this. I, number one, I enjoy preaching book by book through the Bible. I enjoy preaching verse by verse through the Bible because I believe that it's, if it's in the Bible, there's a reason it's there. Amen. Right? I don't believe God to be redundant. Amen. Here's the lesson I take away from the book of Acts. And my prayer is that the Lord would open your heart to this. God loves every person in every situation and they are each special to him. You say, well, it's just another city, another person. That's exactly what God is trying to tell us. His desire is that every city and every person hear the good news of the gospel and have an opportunity to receive him. Now, how does that translate into our lives? And this is just kind of application before the message even, but the sermon series as a whole. How does that apply to our life? God desires for you to be a faithful witness for him wherever you are, whatever context you're in. We see scenario after scenario, situation after situation, uh, different people, different places, and yet the message is the same. God loves sinners. God died to save sinners, and he'll save anyone that comes to him by faith, uh, by his grace, and we rejoice in that. Amen? Amen. Say, well, Jonathan, we've heard this a lot. Can I ask you a question? In the last year, since we've been preaching through the book of Acts, and we've hit evangelism over and 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 over again, how many people have you shared the gospel with? I don't say that to get on to you. I say that to remind you as you're sitting here thinking, same thing over and over, have you actually gotten the message of the book of Acts yet? 
Well, Jonathan, we keep talking about, have you gotten the message that we're here to deliver the good news that Jesus died for sinners? Say, well, I haven't talked to anybody yet. Well, then take this as yet another challenge and another prodding and another encouragement toward opening your mouth and sharing what God has done in your heart. Say amen to that, church. Amen. Amen. Acts 17, we see him as he comes to the city of Athens. He's left Berea because of persecution. The distance from Berea to Athens is about 200 miles. And he's gone and he's waiting. If you look at the rest of this passage, he's waiting for Silas and Timothy. And so naturally, how many of you like to explore, look around places, you enjoy adventuring? Raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you, but you can actually communicate today. It's okay, right? (laughs) You're like, I kind of do, I'm not sure, right? I enjoy going to new places, seeing new things, right? I think that's probably what Paul was doing as he began to walk around in Athens. It was a historical city. It was a beautiful uh, city. There was so much architecture and the arts were so prevalent. It was just, it was, it was unlike anything he'd ever seen before, right? Some of you remember going to a big city that you'd only seen in pictures and magazines or uh, you don't use magazines anymore on the internet, right? Whatever it was. You remember going to that city and thinking, wow, this is just too cool, right? Well, Paul's walking around in Athens and the Bible says that he cannot enjoy what's going on in Athens because there's nothing for a child of God to enjoy in Athens, says he's walking around and his spirit, in verse 16, was stirred in him. Why? He saw the entire city wholly given to idolatry. You, you ready for this? He could not go and spend time in this beautiful place because he realized that everyone he was seeing had a soul that would live forever and die And without Christ would spend eternity in torment. I felt that way when I went and visited uh, Scott's here. Scott lived in Las Vegas for a little while. When I went to Las Vegas, uh, there's some incredible things to see in Las Vegas. But I remember going down on the strip and walking the strip and thinking to myself, this is the most hopeless thing I've ever seen in my life. Why? Because it was full of life. It was full of energy. It was full of lights and amusement and entertainment. But when you peeled it all back, it was empty people trying to fill themselves with something that wouldn't fill them. That's what Paul saw in Athens. Paul saw people who seemingly had everything they could want but were in fact empty. That the phrase there, wholly given to idolatry, it means they were full of idols. They were literally under idols. There were gods everywhere. I said earlier that it is believed that there were 30,000 gods or idols in that city. To understand the, uh, the area there, Athens was next to Mount Olympus, where the Greek gods Zeus and Aphrodite supposedly were and, and kind of hung out, right? They had, in addition, if you've ever seen it, uh, the Parthenon uh, was in Athens. It's a temple that was dedicated to the goddess Athena and was built on the highest hill overlooking the city. It was full of life. It was full of religion even. But it was full of empty people. And Paul was distressed when he saw it. The Bible says that his spirit was stirred in him. Makes me think of Jesus in Luke 19 as he looked over the people of Jerusalem. The Bible says when he had come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. He wept over it. Say, well, why is that? Ravenhill said it well. Ravenhill is a guy, if you've never read him, he's he's a couple years ago, but I enjoy reading Leonard Ravenhill. He said this, the world's lost its power to blush over its vice. The church has lost her power to weep over it. 
Well, what does that mean? It means the world has embraced all kinds of things to the point that there is nothing embarrassing or shaming to it whatsoever. Our society, if you haven't noticed, our, so our society celebrates just awful things. Celebrates perverse things. Celebrates just the most the most depraved things it possibly could, right? As a result, that is uh, seeped, if you will, into the church. And the church, Ravenhill said, has lost its power to weep over it. What, what are you saying? At some point, we become so numb to the ills of society, right, that we just kind of accept it as what it is. Paul comes to the city and he sees this and it stirs his heart. And instead of leaving the city, instead of just trying to create chaos, the Bible tells us in verse 17 that he first preached in the synagogue. And then he went and connected with those in the marketplace daily. He, he, he did his best to reach into multiple audiences. Multiple audiences. Two of the groups of people that we see in this passage are the Epicureans and the Stoics. If you don't know much about them, and I don't expect you do, the Epicureans were atheists. They would be a group of people that would deny the existence of God. Uh, they would deny that there was any afterlife. They were very hedonistic in the way they approach life. Uh, what do you mean? They live for today? They, uh, they pursued pleasure. Um, their deepest desire was to never experience pain, right? The idea, eat, drink, and be merry, tomorrow we die, right? So the Epicureans, and by the way, I think that we probably all know some people that live their lives that way, don't we? Yeah. And they're Stoics. The Stoics were pantheists believing that everything was God and God was everything. And you know some of those as well, right? They spiritualize and hyper-spiritualize everything, right? Stoics desired to live life in harmony with nature. They placed a great emphasis on self-control and self-sufficiency. Their, their motto, if they had one, was just grin and bear it, right? Grin and, and bear it. Apathy was considered one of the highest virtues in life. And that's the way they lived their life. They were completely opposite. So as he went and he spoke to the people, he found himself speaking to some in the synagogue, these Epicureans, and then also the Stoics. And as he came and he began to speak, they were not, um, they were not very excited about what he would say. They referred to him in verse number 18 as the babbler. That idea of babbler, <clears throat> it means a seed picker. They literally saw him as like a little bird flitting around the marketplace, picking up seeds here and there. Uh, they, they thought that he had just a bunch of little fragments of truth with no substance to them. That's what they're talking about when they're calling him a babbler. But there were also some that wanted to hear more about him and about what he was saying. So they bring him uh, in verse number 19. It says, they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, um, saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. Now that uh, uh, Areopagus, it is the equivalent, if you will, of like the Jewish Sanhedrin. So it was not just a location, but it was also a group of people. So it's actually on a mountainside, and they would have stone seats, and their council of the Athenians would meet there. Some of the most brilliant minds, some of the most uh, thoughtful people, they would come up on this hillside to this, uh, this really amazing piece of architecture, and they would meet as a body similar to uh, the Jewish Sanhedrin. And so as he's brought to them, uh, they want to hear what he's got to say. And, and let me just kind of let you in on, on what's going on here. They are not looking to convert from what they believe. They are looking to possibly add Jesus to the list of other gods that they serve, right? 
It's kind of like when you look at the Hindu culture, some of the uh, Eastern cultures, you look at them serving just a multiplicity of gods and they have no problem accepting Jesus as God, but they have a problem accepting Jesus only as God, right? And here is such as the uh, culture of the Athenians. Let's add him into the mix. Uh, it's filled already with idols and ideas. So why not just um, add in this other one? Let's at least hear him out. If you look down in verse number 21, it kind of tells you how they got where they got. In verse 21, it says, All the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. In essence, here's what the, they were all about. They were into fads. What's the next thing? What's the trendiest thought process? What is the, the next hot topic, right? And they were all about knowledge and learning and whatever. And so they wanted to hear what Paul had to say because maybe this is something new that we can add to the mix, right? And they fancied themselves as being up on everything and knowing what was going on. At this point, there's 800 years of Greek mythology and 500 years of Greek philosophy. And yet they are still, and hear me, hear me, please. They are still searching for something to bring satisfaction to their souls. Still searching. Can I say that although we do not live in Athens, people in our context fit into those exact same molds. Looking for something to satisfy their longing. Willing to worship anything that will bring added bonus to their life. We see in our culture people searching, right? So in this passage, uh, we're going to read just a couple, a couple more verses here. But in this passage, if we're going to reach unbelievers with the gospel, we're going to have to communicate with them. And we can't hide from them. Now that sounds like a very basic thought, and yet it's one that doesn't always translate into our lives. If we're going to preach the gospel, it means that at some point we've got to communicate with people and we can't hide from them. So I see in this passage probably six ways that are modeled in front of us by Paul as to ways we can reach out to unbelievers. And I believe it all starts in verse number 22 with honesty. So here's the principle, right? When you're speaking to an unbeliever, begin with honesty. Look at verse number 22. He's standing up in front of this group of cultured people, right? He is speaking to them on Mars Hill. Here's his first words. You ready? Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, verse 22, and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Here's what he's saying. I perceive that you are too religious. Amen. Now I want you to think about this because this sets the stage for the rest of what he'll say. He says, guys, I'm standing here before you and I have a message for you. But let me start by saying I think the thing that you're wrong on is not that you're missing uh, religion, you're not missing worship, you are simply, you are, I just added like four syllables into simply, you are simply, you are simply, it's the cadence, I speak in cadences and sometimes my cadence will add syllables to words that should not be there. You are simply, listen, following after things that won't fill you. You, it's not that you don't have religion. You're very religious. The problem is you're too religious. If you haven't noticed, our culture is definitely a culture of worship. You say, well, I don't believe that because I know a lot of atheists and I know a lot of agnostics. No, no, no. Our culture worships. You say, well, what do we worship? Let me throw one out there for you. Football. Football. Add, add another sport. <laughs> Stand up for the rednecks, right? NASCAR. <laughs> All right. NASCAR, buddy. They get in that car and they just turn their name. Right, Wally? Yes. Now we're speaking Wally. Let's go. Let's go. Right? Yes. Now we're speaking Wally's language, right? <clears throat> oh, man. 
I want to go into, like, I want to talk about, like, I'm a sponsor. I just want to race, and I'm thanking all the, you know, okay. <laughs> we worship. You say, well, what, what do you mean? Uh, there, were, there were football games yesterday that had almost 100,000 people at them. And here's the crazy thing for me. Uh, how many of you watched, what game was it? I would think Alabama, and was it Auburn? Alabama and Auburn? Yes. Went into four overtimes, I think. Yep. Now, here's the crazy thing to me about that game, right? They would show shots of the crowd. And they're going to show Grandpa Bob and Uncle Billy and Cousin Joe. And the one thing that everybody had in that crowd, every time they'd shoot to the crowd, it wasn't the children's section or the children's section. It wasn't the student section. It wasn't just all the students of the college. They were showing just Alabamans. Is that what you call them? <laughs> Alabamians? I don't... Rednecks! <laughs> They would just show, and it's just Joe the plumber and Jack the, I almost said Jack the ripper. <laughs> it's just, just regular people, and here's what they're all doing. They're all losing their stinking minds. Woo! I should have prepared for that. <laughs> hey, he just threw a touchdown. Woo! And going crazy. And listen, the people that were in the crowds, they're representative of just normal people that would never share their emotion except if they were at a football stadium. You ever met somebody like that? You, you, you talk to them, spend time with them, they're just kind of a normal, and you bring them to a ball game and they're just like, they come alive? Can I help you as to why that is? It's because we worship that. Now, I'll tell you this. Listen to me. I love sports as much or more than just about any of you. I can give you stats all day long. I can talk to you about sports. I absolutely love it. And listen, I have to fight that little G God in my life every single day. Our culture worships. You know, we have channels, not a channel, but channels that are dedicated to what's going on with celebrities. Where did they shop? What did they buy? What did they eat? Who did they eat with? When did they go to the bathroom? Give me a break! Dedicated to celebrities. Because it's not enough to watch somebody in a movie. We want to know who they are. We want to know everything about why. We're looking for heroes. We want to worship. Our culture wants to worship. You say, well, I got you there. I don't like sports and I don't like celebrities. So, booyah. You worship something. You worship something. You're passionate about something. You know everything there is to know about something, right? You say, well, I don't like any of those things. Some of you are addicted to social media. Social media is your God. Knowing everything about everybody is your God, right? When, when I grew up, my, my grandma, we'd go over to a grandma's house. And um, uh, grandma would, she listened to the radio every morning. And every day they're saying so-and-so died and so-and-so died and so-and-so died and so-and-so died. And for probably the last 30 years of her life, you would go over to her house and she'd go, you'd never guess who died. <laughs> and get, we live in a small, small county, small, small area in western Kentucky. She'd go, so-and-so, that's the cousin and the step-granddaughter and the blah, 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 of this person they passed away. And she'd just go on and on and on and on. If they'd had Facebook when my grandma was alive, we'd been in trouble, right? She just wanted to know everything about everybody. And she'd tell us people died. We're like, we have no clue who that is, right? Some of us are addicted to just being in the know, right? And that's what Paul starts out with. He says, listen, I perceive that you're too superstitious. You're too religious, Right? <clears throat> begin with honesty. We, we as Christians can sometimes struggle with that. Um, some of us don't have a problem with honesty. We just have no love to accompany our honesty. Some of us have plenty of love but no honesty. You look around you, you look at the chaos, you look at the sin of the culture around us, Look at the sin in our own life. Sometimes we find it difficult to respond to situations biblically with a gospel mindset. Right? 
And we see that Christians, many times, they, they run to extremes. They, they will either isolate. You'll see many, many Christians and others that just because of the wickedness of the world around them, they just run away and hide. Or they insulate themselves. They, they try to spend all their time with only other Christians. They, they don't ever talk to lost people or uh, reach out outside of themselves. Or they imitate the world. And I'm afraid that that's what most, most believers end up. That's where they kind of end up going is they, they just imitate. They just they want to fit in. They end up caving into the culture. But here's what God called us to do as Christians. We're to infiltrate. Infiltrate the lives around us with the gospel. We're supposed to rub shoulders with people that are dark and share light with them. We're told to be salt. We're told to be light. I think it would help us if we stop thinking it's us versus them and started thinking it's us for them. We want to reach them with the gospel. We want to minister to them in their dynamic. You ready for this? One of our problems <clears throat> is we might have a passion for people, but that passion, unless it ever comes out of your mouth, unless it's ever translated into action, that passion does nothing. And Paul stands up and he just gets to the point and he's honest. And he says, listen, guys, I perceive two superstitions. Where does he go from there? He connects them to a need. I, I thought this was very interesting. Um, every time I've ever heard this, even in study this past couple weeks, as we get to verse number 23. I love how he does this. Paul says, for I pass by as I pass by, but held your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. To the unknown God. Let me, let me tell you what this was. I told you they worshiped some 30,000 gods in Athens. But they also had an altar that was, that was for the unknown God. They were so religious, they thought maybe there's another God out there that we don't know about yet. And we don't want to mess things up. So we're going to go ahead and worship this other God as well, even though we don't know who he is, just because we're afraid we might miss out on that. <clears throat> to the unknown God. I want you to think about how insane that sounds. I want you to think about how discouraging that is. Here's what they're doing. They're saying we have a deep desire to know and please God. We just don't know who he is. And so as Paul walks around the city and he sees this altar to the unknown God, his mind begins to think, I can take that that's familiar to them. It's part of their context. And I can link that. To Jesus and I can explain to them that Jesus is the unknown God that they're looking for and that all the other gods are actually nothing the only God they should be serving is the unknown God who my heart and my desire is you ready to make known to make known how many of you like to read like to read how many of you have ever read the book? It's a, it's a missions book by Don Richardson. It's called Peace Child. Anybody ever read the book Peace Child? If you've never read it, uh, it's a very, very interesting uh, book. He was a missionary to um, uh, the Sawi tribe of Irian Jaya. Um, they were cannibals. They were headhunters. And they had accepted him into their context and uh, by accepted I mean they did not eat him but he was struggling to be able to communicate Jesus to them the gospel to them they were constantly fighting each other revenge and murder were actually honored there was no hope for peace but they had this custom and this custom was if one village gave a baby boy to another village 
that as long as that child lived, there would be peace between their villages. And they called that baby a peace child. And so as he's observing their culture and as he's looking at how they're living their lives and he's looking at uh, the murder and he's looking at the revenge and he's, he thinks about this idea of the peace child. And so he comes to them and he presents Jesus as being God's peace child. And he goes on to tell them that because Jesus lives eternally, our peace with God is eternal. And he takes the context that they're familiar with and he communicates Christ in that context uh, to them. He tells them that uh, that God wanted to have peace with them. And that analogy unlocked their minds and they were able to begin to understand the gospel and their sin before God, their need for God. As a result, many of them were saved because he connected that idea of the peace child, right? with Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul's doing here. He says, the unknown God that you're looking for. I know him. Let me tell you about him. He's connecting them to a need. One of the greatest things you can do when you're ministering to people is, you ready for this? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a word that's imperative that you, that you add to your vocabulary. You ready? Listen. You ready? Listen. Can we say that again, church, all together? Listen. Listen. Here's what that looked like. I remember uh, when I sold cell phones. I sold for T-Mobile. Um, when I do something, I want to do it well. And if I'm being honest, I want to do it better than anybody else. And um, I got pretty good at selling cell phones. I was in a large market, and I was a top salesman in that market. Got some cool certificates and awards and trips and money and stuff like that. It was cool. But here's how I became decent at selling. I listened. What, I, what happened was when I came to the store, I watched all the other people that I was training under. And as soon as somebody would come in, they would start talking and they would start trying to sell them on something. And they would sell them on something, and then two days later, that person would come back in the store with the phone they had been sold, and they would return it to me, and they'd want their money back because it wasn't a good phone for them. They were, they were selling like 85-year-old grandma's iPhones when iPhones first came out. It just wasn't a good plan, right? It was the most expensive phone, but it just wasn't a good phone for them, right? And I kept seeing that happen. In my store, the return rate was incredible because you'd walk in, and I would, just, I would just peg you. I know who you are. I know what you want. I'm going to sell you this. And I'd sell it to you, but you didn't need it. Right. So what I started doing was I started listening. I started asking questions. So when somebody would come in to walk in to buy a phone, I'd ask them how their date was. I'd ask them what they, what they did that day. I'd ask, and they're thinking, dude, I came in to buy a phone. What are we talking about? And I'd just get to know them. And here's what I would pick up. They, were, they would say, well, I just got back from visiting my... my um, my grandchildren and uh, my wife live, or my uh, daughter lives here in town. My grandkids got out of school, blah, blah, blah. I listen and I think to myself, so this is important to them. This is important. They probably want a phone with a camera because they've got grandkids they want to take pictures of, blah, blah, blah. And I just listen to their story and I just talk to them, right? And then when it came time to talk about the phone, I say, now here's the deal. I've got this really expensive phone over here. I don't think you need that. I've got this one over here that does this and does this and does it. I don't think you need that. Let me show you this phone. This phone is half the price of that phone, but this is what that phone does. This does that, and I think it would fit your life here. And this phone does that, and it would fit your life here. And they're sitting here, and they're like, this guy listened to me. This guy actually cared about my life. I have people that I would sell phones to that would come back in and give me cookies. It's where, it's, it's where it started, Bill. It's where it started. It why? Why? Be, it hasn't ended. <laughs> why? Why? Because I showed interest in their life. I listened and I was able, we called it in, in what we did, we called it right fitting the customer. Listening to what they actually needed and trying to sell them what they needed, not what I could sell them. Right? People would say, well, what's that over there? It's some accessory that they don't need. And I'd say, well, it does this, but I'm telling you, you don't need it. Or if you really want it, go buy it from Amazon for half the price. 
And you know what it did? It caused them to listen because I was listening to their needs and I was presenting them with a solution to their needs. That's what Paul was doing. Paul said, I'm walking around your context. I'm seeing your worship. I'm seeing how religious you are. But then I see this altar over here. I see the unknown God. I realize that you're still searching. You're worshiping all these other gods, but you're still searching. Guys, I have the answer. I have the answer. Can I tell you, sometimes you just need to listen. Listen to your neighbors. Listen to your friends. Listen to the lady at Walmart. Bethany went to pick up an uh, order at Walmart uh, last night. And the lady just starts talking. Bethany's talking to her. And they're just engaging. Invites her to church and pray that she comes sometime. Uh, but it was just a, she went to pick up groceries. Right? We can listen and talk and communicate. That's what he was doing here. He was connecting their need to the answer to that need. Now, now, I've talked about cells and selling cell phone and all this. I'm not trying to make Jesus gimmicky. Hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. I'm not trying to make Jesus gimmicky. I'm telling you this. We have kind of an extra little bonus here. We know what the world needs. Are you, are you listening? We know what they need. They need Jesus. They need the gospel. So then we have the opportunity to present him to them as the answer to those needs. And, and, and by the way, and maybe this goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, because sometimes I need things spelled out for me. When you connect them to a need, here's the next step. You ready? Clearly present God as the solution to that need. Clearly present God as the solution to that need. We're bad about people who talk to us about their problems and we say, well, you just need to get sober. Well, you just need to quit cheating on your wife. We just need to do this. You just need to do that. What we get sanctification before salvation. Are you following what I'm saying? We expect them to clean up. No, no, no. The gospel transforms life. By the way, the spirit does work you could never do. Connect them to the real need. What is that? Jesus. What does he do? He says in verse number 23, I saw the altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. Let me tell you who he is. He goes on in verse number 24, 25, 26, 27, and he basically teaches a theology 101 class. He says, listen, God that hath made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations, that they should seek the Lord if happily they may fill after him uh, and find him, though he, not, he be not far from every one of us. In the midst of all these other gods, he begins to contrast their gods, their innumerable gods, with the one true God. And he starts out by pretty much echoing Isaiah 45, 5, he says, God says, I'm the Lord. There's none else. There's no God like me. He says, this is the one true God. And then he goes on to spell what he is. He says, hey, he's the creator of all things. He's, he's Lord over all things. He says, listen, you can't contain him in an idol or a building. He said, you can't put him in a habitation made with hands. Our God is above all. He's before all. He's over all. You can't just stick him in a, in a, in a temple made with hands. And by the way, I, I mentioned the Parthenon, the big, the big, the big uh, worship center there, if you will. They're, they're literally talking in the shadow of that, saying, you can't put God in that. It says God doesn't need anything from anyone. He's not worshiped with men's hands as though he needeth anything. God sustains everything. He giveth the all life and breath and all things. He goes on to talk about mankind and how everyone can be traced back to Adam. He talks about th that God is sovereign in his work with every individual and every nation. And then he said, God puts a desire in you to know him. The reason that you have this, this altar to the unknown God is you know, you know that there's something you're missing. He says there in that last verse that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him. Though he be not far from every one of us, he's saying God exists. He's creator. You didn't make God. God made you. God doesn't need you. You need him. God's looking for you even if you're not looking for him. 
And then he circles back to their day. He makes another connection to their culture. He quotes two of their pagan poets. He's, where he says there, in him we live and move and have our being. And then where he says, therefore, we also are his offspring. He's using their, their, their poetry in that culture. It'd be like if we're talking to somebody and we use a quote from a movie line or a lyric from a song, right? Uh, for example, if I'd said the name of this uh, message today is, um, you're too superstitious, and I'd gone, very superstitious, right? You see what I did there, Bill? Yeah. What's he doing? He's connecting. He's connecting. He's bringing them back to something they know. And he's saying, listen, you've made this up and you've created this and God is the solution, right? God's the solution. It says that we're the offspring of God. He goes ahead and says that God's not like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. So he's connected with them. He's made the gospel, he's made God clear to them. And so here's what he does then. He says, hey, that should bring you to a place of repentance. Verse number 30. At the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. I've been honest. I've connected you to God, to this unknown God. I've clearly presented him to you. And now I'm telling you, now that you've seen him, it's time to get right before him. He clarifies God is not just the Savior, but God will also be the judge. In verse number 31, Jesus hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in all righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he had raised him from the dead. Here's what he's essentially saying. Jesus came as the suffering servant. He gave himself, but there will be a day where he returns as judge. And everyone will face the judgment of Jesus. He also says there Jesus has raised from the dead. He's saying, listen, there is an inescapable day of judgment. He did not shrink from telling the truth of that. He did not shy away from speaking about it. He said, one day you will stand before God and you will face him as judge. <coughs> Y'all have heard the phrase, um, hellfire and brimstone. Uh, Stephen, can you come play? Hellfire and brimstone. The thought behind that is, uh, you've normally heard that speaking about a preacher, right? Preacher. Hellfire and brimstone. What does that mean? Uh, it's somebody, it may be delivery style, the way they preach. Hellfire and brimstone. It may be the, the, the content of what they preach. Preaching strong about hell and death and hellfire and brimstone, right? <clears throat> I, in my delivery style, I'm not really a hellfire and brimstone type of preacher, um, but I would be a fool if in my content I did not deliver to you the truth that we all will live forever either in the presence of God or separated from Him in eternal punishment. I wouldn't be worth my salt if I did not tell you that sin has a consequence. There's a payment for that. Now, I'm not exactly a shock jock. I don't want to stand up here and try to scare you into heaven. But I'll just tell you this. If you die in your sin without ever having placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you will spend eternity separated from Him. And you will suffer. And that's where He lays it out. Guys, this is where you are. You say, well, how'd they respond to it? Same way everybody responds to a message like this. Some of them rejected it. Verse number 32. When they rejected, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. They sneered, derided. Huh, yeah, okay. Some of them were reluctant. Verse number 32. Others said, we'll hear the again of this matter. Here's what they're saying. We're not ready to make a decision right now, but we'll think about it. We'll talk to you about it later. <coughs> I believe this. I believe that one of the most dangerous of all days is when a man or woman discovers how easy it is to put things off till tomorrow. I 
I like to procrastinate on mowing my grass. <clears throat> I like to procrastinate on going to the dentist. Bethann doesn't let me do either of those things, but I like to. There are other things that I will procrastinate on that at the end of the day don't have a massive consequence. If I wait a day to mow my grass, it's a day longer. It's a day longer. If I wait to go to the dentist for a day, well then they have to replace a tooth because Bethann knocks one out. They have to replace that tooth and then clean my teeth, whatever. It's a day longer. But putting off Jesus is just not a good idea. And well, I want to think about it. I don't want to scare you, but the Bible says that you're not promised tomorrow. If there's one thing I've learned from being a pastor, being in ministry, I've been in ministry now 10 years. If there's one thing I've learned is this life is short and it ends suddenly. Some people get diagnosis and they uh, are able to kind of plan out the end of their life. And sometimes they're told, I'll have a month, they have a week, but at least they had something. But I'll just tell you, most of the time, that's not how death happens. Most of the time, you're breathing and then you're not. So, so let me present a truth to you. And I, man, I hope you, I hope you hear this. You are not promised forever. So if you don't know God today, today's the day. Don't put it off. Don't wait. Say, well, what if I do? If you do, you're playing with eternity. You're risking everything. And by the way, can I just say this? Salvation is not a get out of hell free card. Let me just be blunt about that. Salvation is not a get out of hell free card. Salvation is an opportunity to have a relationship with the one who made you. He designed you. He knows you. He loves you. He cares for you. He gave his son for you. I don't want to just go to heaven. I want his help right now. I want his spirit to live inside me. I want to follow his word. And why? Because this life is stinking complicated. And it's discouraging. And it's tough. And I want his help. Say amen to that. You're here today and you don't know Christ. Maybe you've been worshiping that unknown God. I'm here to tell you his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Maybe you've struggled with how to communicate the gospel to those around you. I'll just tell you, I don't, I don't think I've heard of many bad ways to do that. <laughs> I just like it when you open your mouth and try. What if I say the wrong thing? How much damage can you actually do by telling them that God loves them and died for them? How much damage can you actually do? God will save you if you'll let him. All you have to do is believe. How much damage can you actually do right there? Open your mouth and share the gospel. Why? Because there's a world that worships the unknown God. And if you're a child of God, you know him. You know him. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes, no one looking around. Father, I love you. I praise you for your goodness. Um... I'm thankful that you work in spite of us. And uh, God, I just pray that you burden our hearts for those around us. God, the world needs you. If we're here today and we have you as our Savior, we have exactly what they need. If there's any here that don't know you as Savior, Father, I pray that you convict their hearts. And right now, even, I pray as we take a moment and share the gospel, I pray they'd be open to that. They'd place their faith in you if they need you. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. No one looking around. Everyone, keep your heads bowed. And I Eyes closed for a moment. I want to ask you two questions. If you say, Jonathan, if I were to die today, I'm confident that has been eternity with the Lord. I know God's my Father. I know I'm a child of God. There's a specific uh, moment in my life. I've placed my faith in Him for salvation. I'm confident He saved me. I know I'd spend eternity with Him. All over the room, would you slip your hand up if you say, that's me, that's my story, that's my testimony all around the room, all around the room. All right, you can put your hands down. Now, a lot of you didn't raise your hands, and uh, there's quite a few of you that weren't able to do that. I'm assuming that by not raising your hand, you're saying, I don't know that if I were to spend eternity, uh, that I'd spend it with God. I've not placed my faith in Christ. I'm concerned about that. 
If that's you today, I'd love to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come to you or call you out. Um, Nobody else is looking around, but I would like to pray for you. If you'd say, Jonathan, if I were to die today, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. I don't have a relationship with the Lord. That concerns me, and I'd like you to pray for me all around the room. Would you just slip your hand up? I'd like to pray for you today all around the room. I see that hand. Anyone else? Ma'am, I've been praying for you for two, three weeks now, and uh, I believe that God loves you. I believe he wants to save you, and he's willing to if you come to him. Anybody else? Anybody else? Say, Jonathan, if I died today, I don't know that heaven would be my home. All right, would you look at me? Would you look at me? I want to give you a challenge today, right? I like, I like sometimes to give you homework. Yeah, here's your homework. Next time you're with people, whether it's a crowd of people or if it's just an individual, my prayer is that the Spirit would remind you that inside whatever it is that you're seeing, there's a soul. So they'll live forever. Live in one of two places, either with God or away from Him. And my prayer is that this church, this group of people, by the way, who's the church? Church is you. Church is you. You're the church. Prayer is that as we encounter people, we'd understand people are more than their mess, people are more than the beauty, people are souls that'll live forever. The next time somebody bugs you, next time somebody bothers you, just remember they have a soul that lives forever. My prayer is that you would feel a conviction. Man, I need to share the gospel with this person. I need to care about their eternity. Man, I need to care about their soul. And can I help you with this? If you're here today and you know Christ is your Savior, you're here and you know Christ is your Savior because somebody cared enough to share that truth with you. Maybe it was a preacher in a service. Maybe it was a co-worker. Maybe it was a friend. Maybe it was a neighbor. Maybe it was a family member. Maybe whatever. There was somebody who cared enough for your soul to share that with you. What if they hadn't? What if you're walking around like the person that you're seeing in front of you? Hopeless. Wondering. Wandering. I thank God for the person who led me to Jesus. I pray that you'd have that heart as well. Hey, listen to me. Acts is about evangelism. There's no way to get around it. There's no way to make it into something else. If we're going to be faithful to that text, that's what it is. Here's Paul standing in front of a group of people and saying, Hey, listen, it's not that you're not religious. It's that you're too religious. I'm just telling you, you're worshiping an unknown God because you don't want to miss out. Because you don't know. Because you're still searching. Because you're still looking. And I'm just telling you, His name is Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the solution. Jesus is the Savior of mankind. And He will be your Savior if you'll let Him. That's the message the world needs to hear. The unknown God doesn't have to be unknown. I know Him. His name is Jesus. Father, I love you. I praise you. Stir us up, God. Please stir us up. We've seen over the past month, we've seen 30, 40 people that we've never met before coming into this place. God, some of them know you, some of them don't, but I just feel strongly that you're just doing something. God, you're you're doing something here because you desire to get yourself glory. And I pray that we'd not get in your way there. I pray that those of us that are Christians would open our mouths and share the good news of the gospel. Those here that have come and they're searching, they're looking, God, help them to find Jesus Place their faith in His finished work on the cross. Oh God, bring them to Yourself. We give You glory. We believe, we believe, God, that You want to do something big through our lives. And I pray that You'd help us just to be obedient to that. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, we're going to close here. I pray that you would see everybody as having a soul. And I want to give you just a challenge real quick on our way out. You ready? You are the light of the world. But if your light's hid, it's hid to those that are lost. If you're covering up that light, if you're not letting it shine, if you're not sharing the good news of the gospel, those who need it most can't see it. You're a city on a hill. You are the light. 
You are exactly what the world needs. Stand to your feet. Let's sing together as we close. If you're a guest, drop that connect card in the back. Get a gift from us if this is your home. We're thankful you're here. I love you. God bless you. All right, join us in Sing Cornerstone. Sheets at the back. We'll see you this evening.